we go. Thank you once again for giving us so much food for thought in the presentation. Pastor James Hendricks has our next keynote. He serves as the Director of Evangelical Mission for the South Carolina Synod. He received his Master of Divinity from Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary and a Master's in Theology from the University of Helsinki's Religion, Conflict, and Dialogue. He, we're excited to tap into those particular gifts as we seek to see Jesus in those we don't see eye to eye with. Welcome to the podium, Pastor. Thank you. So I do need your help for my presentation because uh, here's the situation I'm in right now. It is, I have just at about four o'clock on a Friday, and uh, we had Lutheran men cooked a very heavy breakfast, we had a very heavy lunch, and they just fed you snacks. <laughs> and I don't want to have to unplug and plug back in the microphone to get your attention, because we all know how much noise that makes. So work with me here. We're going to have, we're going to stay awake, we're going to focus. Because uh, we're talking conflict. Uh, I see Jesus in those who disagree with me. And I'm going to do what any good pastor I would hope should do, and we're going to start with a word of scripture. So for this, I've looked at Matthew 18, for where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says, I am there among them. Now, I'm going to zoom out here for a minute because I'm doing the thing that we pastors like to do. I know I'm talking about conflict. I've picked a verse that kind of already helps me out with where I want to go, and I've taken it out of context. So let's zoom out. <laughs> let's put it in some context. So if another member of the church sends against you, here's your instructions. I'm not going to read this wall of text at you, but I think this is a familiar text to you. Uh, Jesus giving his disciples in Matthew chapter 18 instructions on how to handle conflict. And then at the end of that, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus wasn't talking to your worship and music uh, committee when he said that. It's not, well, we only have five people in worship, but we're two or three are gathered. No, it was whenever you are fighting, whenever it is uncomfortable, whenever you've already brought somebody with you, you've gone to the whole church, and it's getting really uncomfortable, Jesus promises that he's with you. Okay, zooming back out again, I've done the same thing, right? I've picked a passage of scripture that already helps me out with where I want to go for where I'm going. So we're Lutherans, scripture interprets scripture. Colossians 3, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds together in perfect unity. Now I'm back to where I was, right? I took a bit of scripture, which helps me out, ripped it out of context, and now here I am presenting it. So I could go on, and I could lengthen that out and do the same thing I just did. And I could do the same thing with all of these verses. And I didn't want to make another slide that was just even more text on top of this. So I'm hitting you with scripture. I know, probably not a very good etiquette there. But I'm doing all of this to make a point. If we have our Bible and our eyes open at the same time, it's clear that the way that we see one another and interact with one another is a defining part of our faith. This isn't part of our faith that's off in the periphery, right? This is at the center of what it means to be a Christian. It's that we see one another as members of the body of Christ. And as we think about conflict in the church and how hard it can be, the starting point for our understanding of our disagreements is Jesus' presence among us, where two or three are gathered, and our belonging with one another in this body of Christ that we share. So what do we expect? And this is when I realized uh, this morning, too, after we heard Pastor Chris Christopher yesterday uh, talk about the ministries that he serves. We heard Pastor Kara Stewart talk about the ministries that she serves. What I'm doing today is talking to you not about my ministry, but equipping you for your ministry. So we are all responsible for ourselves in conflict, and this is Senate Assembly. I'm assuming that if you're in this room, you are a church leader, whether that is in title, whether that is in reputation, wherever it is that you are, you are a leader of your congregation. And so this is the challenge that we all face, especially in our society today. How do we live out this calling of our faith to see one another, to see Christ in one another, in a world that takes the divisions that our society presents us and treats them as they are the norm? 
And so even for us that we have to answer for ourselves, are we actually expecting God to show up? Because as we all know, in the first chapter of John, when uh, Jesus goes to the water to be baptized, John sees Jesus coming to him and cries out, Behold, the Lamb of God who kind of makes us all a little bit better. <laughs> all right, four on a Friday. It took you a little long to get there, but we got there. No, we, our faith is important. God shows up. God, that's our Lutheran logic. God has promised that God is going to be present in conflict. God is faithful to God's promises. Therefore, wherever two or three are gathered in conflict, God is there. And so the things that we believe are not meaningless. Again, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? I'm saying this to the room full of people who care enough to show up to a synod assembly and hear me uh, not run off to the bar already at four on a Friday, right? <laughs> but if the things that we say that we believe are true and we believe that they are, this opens us to a radically alternative way of being in the world. This was true in the first century. I mean, there was an uprising right after Jesus died a few years in Jerusalem. It wasn't like there was some magical first century time that was without conflict. And then here we are coming up on another election cycle. All of those things right after a pandemic, yada, yada, we know what times we live in. But this isn't new to the church. And so as we think of this, we need to start with ourselves and can make these commitments to one another that the things that we say we believe about the body of Christ actually mean something for us in conflict. And that the way that the news cycle tells us they are, or the way that the, our culture treats our conflicts, is not the way that we, they naturally are, at least according to our faith. So let's get practical. All right, so if you're taking notes, this is the diagram that you want to draw because I'm going to fill it in. And I also want to say this is not mine. This is the Thomas Kilman Conflict Index if you want to Google that later. Um, but what we have here is a graph. So if you're visual, I hope this is helpful. And so on the x-axis, the horizontal line, we've got the importance of a relationship in conflict. So not important, greatly important. And then we've got the importance of the issue, less important, more important. So. Let's make this make sense, we'll fill it in. So if the issue that we're talking about is not important, and the relationship is not important, then we avoid. Example, uh, I was actually driving to a congregation to work with them on some conflict issues that they were having. I was a two-lane part of 26 towards Charleston, and I passed a semi and did not do that uh, fast enough for the person who flew up behind me and then gave me the one finger wave as he drove on by. Do I know them? No. Do I care to get to know them? Not after that. <laughs> right? Am I going to chase them down to the next exit and like, I don't know, give the one figure wave back? No. I have better things to do with my time. Or stepping on some toes. Is that person who said that thing on the internet that made you angry? Do you know them? No. Do you care to get to know them? Probably not after what they just said. Do you need to leave that comment and waste your time on that? Probably not. If I just offended you, you can please send all hate mail to jasonashafer at gmail.com. <laughs> also example of avoiding. <laughs> all right, so let's uh, move up. Uh, when, we, uh, when the relationship, and I'm not going to say is not important, when the issue is more important than the relationship, that's when control is the appropriate strategy. So think health or safety. In a church context, healthy control means that the person with three DUIs probably doesn't get to drive the youth van. <laughs> right, like we all understand that that's important to protect the ministry. We all understand why that's the way it is. Is it gonna have some effects on the relationship? Possibly, right? We trust our pastors to follow up on that. But in those moments, right, the resp responsible thing for everybody involved is to say, hey, here's our guidelines, here's our rules, here's our policies. I'm sorry. This is how it's going to be. All right, and then right in the middle, we've got compromise. Uh, I don't think I need to explain what a compromise is, right? You know, let's meet in the middle. The benefit of this is if you need to make a quick decision, it's right there. Let's meet in the middle. Uh, the downside to a compromise is that well, you met in the middle, and a lot of the underlying needs or issues may not be fully resolved, and down the road, if you don't spend some time 
it's probably going to pop up again. All right, if the relationship is really important, but the issue is not, you accommodate. Uh, for anybody who is married, um, I am sure you can tell me about that. And I'm going to pick on Ben Berenstein, who got married, what, a couple of months ago? How's... I'm... <laughs> yep. <laughs> right? You know, when we got married, my wife folded clothes one way. I fold, but folded my clothes a different way. Now I fold my clothes a different way. It doesn't matter to me, right? We do this all the time. But unfortunately, if things are uh, in ministry, this looks like, hey, I started this ministry. I handed it off to somebody else. Are they doing it how I want them to? No. Is the ministry continuing and thriving? Absolutely. Have at it, right? Let it go. Give the keys to somebody else. And then where we really want to head is this top right quadrant, which is collaborate, where we work together. And in this, the issue is important. The relationship is important. The downsides is that this takes time and intentionality. But the reward is that once you do this, it strengthens, right? Conflict itself is not unhealthy. It's how that we handle conflict that becomes toxic, unhealthy, and damaging. So this is where conflict can actually be good, where we integrate decisions, where you bring your part, I bring my part, and then we end up with something that's better than where we both started that works for our community as a whole. The other thing I want to point out at this point is that all of these are perfectly valid strategies for conflict depending where you are. Where we can very easily get into trouble is when we try and use the wrong strategy in the wrong quadrant. So if something is, let's say, the relationship's very important to you, but you're trying to control, you're not playing the winning hand. Right? Or if uh, you just... The other important thing, too, I'll say here is it's very tempting to just mirror somebody else's strategy. So they don't want to talk about it? Fine, I don't want to talk about it. Now, if both people are avoiding it, is that really moving anything forward? Right? So, okay. So we are all adults, but sometimes we need to be the adult in the room. And um, we all have this as leaders in the church, the responsibility to, as best we can, play with the right strategy in the right situation. So... Now the question is, how do we get to collaboration? Because I think, again, we're the church. Relationship is always very important to us. But at the same time, we're dealing with issues that are also very important to us. So I'm going to give us a case study, and we're going to look at this. So we have, I'm going to call it, call it St. Peter and the Keys Lutheran Church, and they just had a break-in. Goodness. And during the break-in, somebody uh, got into the office and made off with an extra set of keys. So the property committee, they are an excellent property committee. They are on it. The next day, they've got the locksmith. They've got the new keys made, and they have to go with it a new policy on who gets a copy of the keys because in their audit, they came up with a new realization that we never really knew how many were out there in the first place. Now, a week later, the office phone, I can tell you all are reading ahead. <laughs> Next week, somebody's there to meet somebody with the copier contract, and what do you know? The keys that have worked for 20 years obviously don't work. Sunday morning, they go to the property committee, and they say, why don't my keys work? Heated words get exchanged, and then the pastor hears the five words that every pastor loves to, you, loves to hear. Pastor, what do you think? <laughs> so what is this poor pastor going to do? All right. How do we get from, because this is how we hear this, right? The property committee says, well, we had a break-in, and I'm sorry, but this is what we need to do to keep our building safe. We worked really hard on this policy. The property chair says, we worked hard. We prayed over this. We feel that this is the faithful decision for our, our congregation, and I'm sorry, but this is the policy that we've established, and I think we need to stick to it. Are they wrong? I'm going to throw that out there. And, but then the volunteer says, well, I've been a member for, and let's just fill it in, right? We're Lutherans. We've been here forever. I've been a member for 30 years. I've been baptized here. I was confirmed here. I grew up here, and I've spent all my time here, and you don't trust me. I am here to volunteer, and yet I can't even get into the building when I need to negotiate the new contract to save this church money. Now, what I want to point out here is I can actually see both of these positions, and so if we're arguing about right or wrong, we've already lost, all right? Because is anybody wrong, right? 
So this is what we've got to do. We have got to move. First of all, we've got to listen. And I'm going to say that again. We've got to listen. So pastors, that means stop talking and listen. I must have hit a chord with somebody somewhere. <laughs> all right, because, and this is the secret to getting past all of this, is what we're listening for is if we've already drawn all lines, and if we've already come up with the positions that we have, so in our example, the positions would be the property, sem the property team says, this is what we are doing, this is our policy, there's our line. That's where we stand. And if the volunteers already said, Darn it, I need a key. And they probably didn't say darn it, but they want the key. Those are positions. What we're listening for are the values. So what we're listening for is we know that the property team, after a break-in, is very concerned about making sure that the church property is safe and cared for. That is a good and healthy thing for people in your congregation to care about. At the same time, a member got embarrassed. Let's name that. And they want to know that when they volunteer, they feel important, that their contributions are appreciated, and that they are able to contribute in a way that's meaningful for them. That is a good and important thing for people in your congregation to hear. So, sorry, pastor, what do you think? What's your playbook? Because some of you might be getting this as council presidents or choir members who are hearing the talk afterwards that not come into the pastor. What we want to do is uh, work on, I call this work on solving the same question, because what we're doing is people are solving different questions. Your property committee is focused on how do we keep the building safe? The other person, the volunteer, is saying, how does a volunteer get in to do the work they want to do? If you're not solving the same question, it, is it surprising to us that we're getting to different answers? It shouldn't be, right? No? Okay, it's four o'clock, wake up, all right. Not quite five, but all right. So solving the same question. And so um, just the way that I go about this or the way that I suggest you can go about this, because of course when we're in conflict, it's helpful to have a framework because that's not when you're thinking as rationally as you could. What I try and do is it's the how do we blank while blank. And you don't name the positions, you name the values. So in our St. Peter and the Keys Lutheran Church, how do we keep the building safe while making sure our volunteers have access. Because what you've just done here is everybody sees what's important to them reflected in this question. If the property committee can answer that question, they're happy. If the volunteer can answer that question, they've got their answer. But if we're so locked in positions before we even have a conversation, and again, I'm gonna say this, you're all gonna nod and agree with me, but listen for it in the future, right? We're all gonna have arguments with our spouses at some point in the near future. Big or small, and listen to where you end up talking, and is it positions or is it values? So, and this is where I think for the church, what we say, I'm going to bring this back to the theology, right? Because we started theology, dipped into the social sciences, and now we're coming back to where we started. Because we can't get past positions if we don't care about the other person, right? This goes back to the relationship. Part of collaboration means working with the other person to solve their problem as well as solving your problem. And so it's central to our understanding of the body of Christ that the people we disagree with are a part of it. They are our brothers and sisters in baptism, not just people who make us say, oh, brother, but they are our brothers and sisters. And conflict is a consequence of our interdependence. It comes when we need one another, not when we don't need it, right? Because if I don't need you, you don't need me. We don't, ain't, we don't have a reason to fight. You walk your way, I walk mine. But as communities that's bound together in our baptism, bound in our faith, bound by the sacraments, conflict is going to happen, but God has promised God is going to show up. And so especially in our community today, in our world today, just to have that perspective is radically different, I believe, than what the world is offering. Because Turn on the TV and what you're going to see, this side wants this, this side wants this. Let's watch them fight it out in the middle because that's really entertaining and we're just in some sort of political blood sport, right? Is it solving problems? Goodness, no. And this is where I believe as the church, we need to expect more. 
We need to expect more from God, that God is going to show up and be faithful to God's promises because God has said God is going to be there for us. And we need to expect that we can actually see things differently and see change in this world when we actually act like the gospel indicates that we can. And so a big part of what our own personal piety is in our own devotion is learning to see the world rightly. If I could add anything to the uh, armor of God, it would be a pair of glasses, right? Because it's not just enough to be able to see this, to be able to recreate what I drew for you. I mean, it is nice that it makes a cross, so it's easy to do that, right? Everybody can draw that. But it's not just to be able to know that. Like, we have to actually take the, con- the time to commit to practicing to do this differently. We have to apply the knowledge. Because I've probably not said anything that we couldn't, in our collective wisdom, already come up with, right? This isn't groundbreaking, earth-shattering. But what it is, it's providing us a way to move forward in a way that actually aligns with the beliefs and the values of our faith and the promises that God has made for the transformation of this world. And so I think that's what enables us to be able to say, I see Jesus and those who disagree with me. Thank you.